Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Zedbert. I'm the assistant curator of art here at the museum and the curator for Emergence, the National Arts of Central Illinois. Uh, can you hear me there? There we go. That's better. Um, I am uh, very happy to be here tonight to introduce uh, two of my favorite artists in Peoria. Uh, but before before we get to them, we have to uh, recognize a few people that were key to making the lecture series happen, making the show Emergence happen. That's uh, John and Sharon Amball. Sid Rodrigo and Andrew Rand, and uh, all the Vision Visionary Society members and all the museum members. Uh, this is number five in a series of nine lectures that are in conjunction with the uh, Emergent Show, and uh, they've been really great. And uh, I, I think Anita and John are going to continue that. Uh, they've got uh, over 20 years of uh, living in Peoria, working, uh, working as artists, working as educators currently. They are both professors of art at uh, Illinois Central College. And um, I think they'll have a lot to say, so enjoy. Here's Anita Tuchila. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, hopefully this isn't too loud. Let me know if I blast your ears. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and be daring and show a blast from the past. This is one of my older paintings, and it um, exhibits my love for paint. I consider myself to be more of a painter than an artist, which is kind of weird, I know, um, because you can't be one probably without being the other. Uh, I love the formal attributes of art. I get involved with a line rolling along to create a, a, a point, rolling along to create a line, a line closing in to create a shape, a shape taking form, becoming a plane shift, and um, becoming a volume, and then relationships of those things within the picture plane um, to create compositional forms. And I uh, really just get a kick out of the material. So that's just a little bit of background about uh, where my priorities lie. Um, I gotta come back to the podium to click through. Um, the reason why I really wanted to show this is so you can see that juicy kind of uh, paint. Um, for example, I, I do wanna point this out. Like that little mark right there, the whole painting for me is about this, and then it's highlighted by that little move, and then it takes you down into uh, other similar shapes. So repetition of motif is always really fun with me, direction of mark, overlaps, I like to create a lot of uh, illusion by placement of the paint. Um, so maybe some areas, like the hair is on top of the background, but then the background becomes on top of the hair. So the background is overlapping that to push that edge back. And then the hair is on top again. And then the background comes on top. And so I love that kind of a play. So when I'm painting, I'm really thinking about those choices that I'm making. Um, I, I always, from the past, painted uh, subject matter that was interesting, but really it was a means, it was a means, is this working? No. Hello. It was a means to the paint. And so, maybe I don't even do this. Can you all hear me okay? No. No? no. Um, but it was really a means 
means to getting to the paint. It gave me passages that I got to paint, experience, see, I loved it. Um, and it was all about uh, the construction. So I'm more of a builder, I feel like I am. In this piece in particular, I wanted to show this. It's a, an older piece as well. And it has the figure, and the figure is kind of flat, but then it has some little pieces of illusion. Um, but the biggest illusion comes when you have the overlap figure in the space uh, on top of the doorway or mirror image that is not identified yet. So that idea, that relationship between what could be a reflection or another person uh, was an interesting kind of play. And then I just uh, thought I'd include this piece because this piece uh, stirred a whole identity series. So when I painted this, it was actually a model, and this was the setup, and it was pretty straightforward. And um, the figure was in this environment, the way that I cropped it, it really made the figure feel alone, but kind of satisfied with life. You know, you don't see any contemplation over anything severe. Um, I took this, this idea along with my love for the figure and wanted to work on concept because this is when I was a graduate student at the University of Notre Dame and that education was a lot more um, conceptual. They were less concerned with the formal attributes, um, only if they were going to of course support the concept. But uh, my previous education was at Indiana University and there I, we would sit there and talk about one little piece of paint for hours about how if it were a different direction, it would complete the composition and how maybe a, a shape was taking away from the composition. So we were always talking about construction. It was very formal. And so when I went to Notre Dame, it was a whole other ball of wax, and they said basically, hey, if you want to stay here, then you've got to get on board. And so I was challenged to get out of my comfort zone, and which I did. So I did a lot of work. I mean, tons of drawings, paintings, and um, then I fell into a series I call my identity series. In the identity series, I have uh, a group of figures, and um, this series was done with a specific palette. The palette is very polluted, and so it's not to sit there and to be glamorous in any way, but it's more for contemplation. And so I tried to use more complex color situations. Um, and then very simple, you've got a figure that's outside this mirror reflection or hallway, and then you have the figure within the reflection or the hallway. And at first they just started as a figure reflecting in the mirror, a simple activity. This one's belly. I have a few that are called belly, but this one um, was one that was much more about being alone, about being isolated. And um, my audience was, of course, a, a female audience at this time. Um, so it was not definitely not a universal read. I was talking about female issues and the pressure of Western society, um, that Western society places on the female figure. And so a lot of it is, you know, is your belly too big? Is it too small? Um, you know, is this too big or that too small or, you know, do I have other issues going on? So I was really talking about uh, all kinds of female issues and so a female audience could probably relate to this more than a male audience. Not that men don't have these concerns, they do, um, but I was just addressing the female uh, body. All right, this one is examination and this, uh, was a different kind of idea. It was not only just uh, looking at the, the form as acceptable or not, but it was also, because it's called examination, um, has overtones of um, health at the same time. So, is that that? And then here we have panty line, and panty line was an exciting one for me because it was fun and um, Painting the painting line was a lot of fun, just formally how do you do that? And at the same time, the composition was neat, how the uh, reflection became the doorway. And so this opened up a different kind of uh, way of thinking about 
being alone? Are you ever really alone when you have your thoughts, I suppose? Okay. This one's I surrender, and uh, it's pretty much a given. The acid green pants kind of go with kind of like that law feel. And this one is a little bit of my claim to fame. This one is in um, Painting as a Language. Uh, it's a textbook on, on painting, and it's in the section on identity. And um, it's kind of wild because big butts are kind of in now, so um, this might be outdated. <laughs> one thing I tried to do at the time, though, was to really accentuate the form and make her the solid figure very sexy. Um, I mean, I even like highlighted and whatnot. And then um, at the same time, she's looking at a reflection. She's critiquing this, but really she's got a beautiful form, but she's still questioning. So like I said, this, this series isn't for everyone. Um, I think it's, it's more uh, for people coming of age maybe or people that are, that are able to remember what it was like to go through this time. All right, at the same time that I was creating the, the portrait in the very beginning and the large piece of the figure with the mirror, I was doing a, another series, and this series was the coming of age series. And so, of course, we've got our young adolescent. She's got her little friend down here. She has all of her friends here. She's got her man. She's got her career, her goal, maybe. She's got a lot of questions going on. So I thought it was, it was fun. And then I thought, well, I'll just paint this figure over and over again in different situations. And I just included three. But I, of course, you know, when you do a series, you do a study, trying to understand what you're doing and what construction, what relationship in the picture plane is saying what you really want to say. And which is interesting because I found my way through this series to another series that became more effective um, and more universal. So I went on and I had like, I don't know, probably 10 of these little squares I did of her on the bed with the poster and the bear. And with the sheet on, with the sheet off, you could see the mattress and different um, variations. And then um, I did this piece, I call her my wallflower. And my wallflower um, obviously has flowers on the wall. And then those flowers, I wanted to create a repetition motif. And so for me, you can see that these little pieces, these little pimples are like little flowers on her face. It's a normal part of life, but yet we tend to critique that, that that's not acceptable in our society. You gotta cover that up. And why do you have to cover that up? I just, I don't understand this stuff. And so um, I was really trying to paint more about uh, the, the stress, the critique of Western society on every individual. And so that became my, my new um, play. And so this series was, uh, is my fun nose hair plucking, um, uh, face hair plucking, pimple popping series. And they're kind of, they're, it's like serious humor. It's definitely serious, um, but it is pretty funny. The things that we do to ourselves so that we can fit into society. So when I created these pieces, um, they were like little um, windows like the little ports into a private moment, and the viewer uh, was privy to these private uh, situations. And so with that, with that um, ability to look through these windows, uh, you're able to have a dialogue with yourself about what you do. So in qu basically questioning, um, it's like a social critique. So. Here you go, here's another one. You know you've all been there. <laughs> and then we've got some eyebrow plucking and pimple popping and looking like a donkey and I really did gray up the teeth and everything to make that reference. 
and putting it in contact, the fact that it's not there makes it even more, like what are you doing to yourself? And then, um, I left that series, I had um, a little bit of a, a break, I had family, and then uh, one day, my husband was outside working, and uh, there was a bunch of water, because he works with water, and he makes these paper pieces, which he's about to tell you, and tell you in a little bit about how he does his process, and the sky and the air, there was just like no atmosphere, there was just amount, the right amount of clarity, and it was like looking into a looking glass. It was so beautiful. So I got my camera and I started just shooting all these gorgeous shadows and reflections. And that's really where I'm at today um, is with shadows and reflections. So this series is called Reflection and it has so many different metaphors. You can just pick one and go with it. I'll just go ahead and run through. I hope we do that time for you. Um, here's another piece. Now this piece becomes more skin-like. And uh, so it's like flesh and uh, cloth. And then we go into this piece, which was more about transparencies and opacities, uh, direction of mark and edge quality. You can tell, I mean, it's just, I'm very much, when I remember a lot of these, I can sit there and talk about all the formal concerns. And these were my pretties. When I thought about these, I thought about, these are definitely my shinies, my pretties. Here's my whirl. And um, of course, it's got all these great, fun ellipses, and you're running around, and there's little drips of water, and uh, you've got your, you know, almost a complementary here and there, more blue, brown, uh, orangey brown. So you're playing off the orange and the blue, fun, and then the yellow and the violet, fun. And so, like I said, it just um, is more formal to me. So these pieces were kind of like um, referential abstractions. The way that I crop them, I kind of had fun with that. So sometimes you can kind of tell what it is, but you don't really know what it is, but it's kind of fun to look at. And you can imagine that could be a reflection, but it could be the actual thing. So I did this for years. And then I got into my little birds. And this was just a snapshot that I included. That's, it's got glare and whatnot, but it's a snapshot of uh, the piece that's upstairs. Um, I have uh, the next three slides are the pieces that are upstairs. And what happened was um, every day when I take my break to go get a coffee, oh, sorry. Every day um, when I would go take my break to go get a coffee, um, I would have a uh, witness birds because they hit the window of the glass, you know. They see themselves and they think that they can fly on, they think it's an extension, but it's not. Which is really sad for them. It's like a bittersweet thing for me because I feel bad for the bird, but then I'm able to go up close to it. And even started posing some of these birds and um, documenting them. Really enjoying them and thinking about it. Thinking about life and, um, you know, what an amazing gift we have. I, I was paying homage to these birds and uh, realizing how grateful I am. And so it started my grateful series. So this is, I'm grateful for uh, food. It's got the ribbon that's kind of like, turns into a worm. And um, that's what this piece is all about. The next piece, this is grateful for my voice. And so you can see what it looked like before it was finished. If you've already seen the finished piece, this is a snapshot before it was finished. And then this piece is uh, grateful for her home. And because um, it's got the little nest, you know. And then this piece is, um, is compassion. There's so much action with the crow that I thought, well, this piece is definitely more about doing something. And it felt like it had some kind of an empathy. So it feels more like a compassion piece to me. So all of these pieces keep coming back to me, like when I was creating these, then I'm like, oh, the shadows of these birds are so much fun, why don't I just paint the shadows? And then I, I started to get into uh, shadow work, and this is where I'm gonna end my talk, and I'm gonna show you three of my newer pieces that I'm working on. I'm not sure if they're finished or not, but here you go. 
This piece is, um, it's an oil glaze on a clear gesso panel. And it's six inches by six inches. And what I do is I have multiple lights and I shoot cast shadows of my hands on uh, wood. And then I transfer the shadow values onto a piece of wood. So I'm kind of having fun with that. I love the idea of um, the lack of energy or the removal of energy because it feels more like energy. Um, because of course, whenever you have its opposite, <coughs> the opposite reads stronger. The idea that if I want to make a red canvas red, I need to include some green or it's not going to read red. Everything's in context in a picture frame. And so with this, I'm really playing with the cast shadow versus the light area and the multiple of it and how one bit of light will erase part of another shadow um, as they're layered. Okay. And here's another piece, a shadow piece. And then here's my last one. Okay. And um, are there any are there any questions? And there. Yeah, we got one in the back. I enjoy your the uh, the facial ones of pimple popping and so forth. Uh, are there? Thank you. Are there performative influences that you looked at? They look so theatrical and kind of voice through gesture and movement. Just wondering if you had uh, been interested in performance artists or, or film, or was there something that influenced that series? Uh, that's a really good question. And um, thinking back, I think um, with those, it's probably more books, articles, actually magazine articles that influence that series. Uh, Lyndon Jackson, um, the biology, the sociobiological aspects of beauty was a book that I was looking at at the time, along with a lot of other pieces. Um, and then my friends, just watching my friends and women that I grew up with, um, and what they were doing to themselves to fit in, definitely influenced me. And then I would just have people pose. I have um, over 50 of these in this series. And um, the pieces that you saw are the ones that I have remaining that I kept. And um, so the pieces uh, that were a part of the 50 sum, I've got like young kids, I've got older people, I've got teenagers, I've got 30 something, 40, I've got every kind of uh, age group, race, um, uh, you name it. I mean, it's just, I really played with skin tone and um, some of them, you can't even tell if they're male or female because I think we all do crazy things like this just to fit in. Because if you don't, a lot of times you're ostracized. It's just the way our society works. So, um, in terms of, I can't really uh, connect with any films or anything like that. Do you know of any performance pieces that I would like to look at? No, I was just curious of, of the influence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's always an honor to have a, a group of audience, you know, this year interested maybe in what you have to say about your work. So I'm honored to be part of the show and, and I'm honored to be here in front of you guys tonight. So I'll try not to bore you. The thing that is with me about when I speak to groups of people that I'm just gonna say it right out, I have a tendency to like put too many images in my slide presentation. So I have about six million slides I'm gonna go through <laughs> in the next 26 minutes. <laughs> but I wanted to start here with this one and I purposefully left it uncropped and just like a snapshot, which is exactly what it was. It was a snapshot out of a window that is at the Harwood Museum in Taos, New Mexico. And I was lucky enough to get a residency in 2007 for five weeks, and I, that's the view from my studio down there looking at the Harwood Museum. Has anybody been to Taos before? Yeah, some of you have been. So you know what a beautiful place is. It's mountains, it's got the desert landscape, and this museum is part of the University of New Mexico. Uh, I, I went to graduate school at UNM in Albuquerque, and my first professional job in art and education came with an opportunity to work at Harwood. 
So this was back in like 1995. This picture I took in 2007 on my residency. But in 95, there was a group of students coming out from the University of Notre Dame that was gonna work with our UNM program, in newly developed program in Southwest Studies. And I was a staff assistant for that program. So lo and behold, Anita was a Notre Dame graduate student and she came out as one of the first groups of students. And I was not a teacher, I was a band driver, you know. <laughs> just a band driver. But that's where we met. And we met at part, at part of at the Harwood and because of this institution. So it's a good place to start. I was trying to capture the sunset, you know, because it's so beautiful down there. And the landscape is outrageously amazing. So as a painter, you know, I was, uh-oh, what did we do? I pushed the wrong button. There's another view of it as it cooks down just a little bit, trying to get right into the sky. As a painter and an artist living in New Mexico, even in the Midwest, I've always been attracted to landscape painting. It's just something that I love. I don't know, it's just a thing. That it's, that's enough for me, but it's not enough for everybody sometimes. So uh, I was also teaching down there, and I would teach outdoor studio classes. And I would take them to places like this, which is the Fajada View, which is at Chapel Canyon, it's out in the Four Corners region, uh, where New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona meet up. So it's way out there in the desert. You gotta drive for 40 miles on a dirt road to get there. And the view is, it actually has a little sundial up here with jet, a sun dagger. You're not allowed to go up there anymore because people have vandalized it. But it's in my class out there and we do paintings, you know, of landscapes. So this was a landscape painting that I made around that time of the Fajada view out in Chaco Canyon. So that's what I still love to do, but I had a teacher, you know? And he was one of my graduate teachers, it was very important at the time. And he said, who, I was signing up for the outdoor studio class, he said, who, who wants to be the world's millionth landscape painter? Who wants to paint the world's 10 millionth landscape? And he made it sound so horrible. But I thought, oh, not me. But, but secretly, I'm in there going, well, I do. So I had to figure out a way to satisfy I suppose, the desire of the higher education with my desire for landscape. And then as a, as a grad student, what I ended up doing was making a series of sewer breaks because I found all of these breaks on the ground are so beautiful. And I also was working as a, as a woodworker. I got a job working in a shop, a wood shop of all places. And I learned how to make templates, use routers and tools and stuff like that. So one of my other teachers said, that stuff's going to find your way into your work. What you do as a person will find its way into your art. And sure enough, I began making templates and I began constructing and also designing my own sewer covers because I felt like every step I took closer to being an artist, I felt like I was also that much closer to the gutter, you know? <laughs> because when you have just this much to live on and just as you're truly trying to stretch things and make, is this actually the best choice to do? continue as an artist. So the greats came out. And I, my show was called, I thought it was funny, I called it Great Works. <laughs> G-R-A-T-E. And this is like a, sort of the bell, the bell system uh, design, you'll see, but I injected my own little T's that are like upside down. So the whole middle part is made with inverse T's for my name, you know, to chill. Okay, so that's my graduate work is all of these great work pieces here. That's the only one I'm showing you. I think it's pretty good. Oh. Okay, at the same time, I love going out, hiking. It's beautiful out there. It's beautiful here too, but it's really over out there. There are a ton of places where you can go and you can see lots of prehistoric ruins and things like that. This was uh, not a, an image that I took, but I found it from a National Geographic magazine. I like looking at those. And it's a petroglyph that was up in the Four Corners regions in Utah. And I thought that it would make a good basis for a painting. So I was in, in graduate school, I made this painting of this thing. But it wasn't until later that I actually combined it with one of my sewer rates. I cut it down, and at first I didn't know what it was. It was a, it was a cocoa pelly, is what it is. You guys aware of it? I always thought it was some kind of a black chevron. And I never saw the flute player in it, which was the orange part. So if you look at the black, it looks like a design. But if you look at the orange, you see the legs and the body, and the arms, and the flute. So I felt like it was good to sort of slam together 
some of these prehistoric references with some of my sewer grates that I thought maybe matched in design. So that was the purpose of a whole series of works like this. I thought they came out pretty good, you know? I was, I was satisfied with the result. Then I was just like super, super chant meeting at Borders Books in Albuquerque, of all places. I met Paco Benitez, who was a friend of mine when I was in graduate school. And I said, hey, Paco, what's up? So he had to talk to me, you know? And he started telling me about an opportunity where he, they were putting together a show of New Mexico artists that was going to go to France, in a museum in France. And I said, that's awesome, Paco. I think that's great what you're doing. And he said, well, we don't really have any room for any more people. You know, it's just already set. I said, Papa, that's just awesome. I'm just so glad to see you and that you're doing some cool stuff. He said, well, I really don't, I really like to work for you and just send me some slides and I'll take them with me because I'm leaving in three days. So I went home and I put together a little packet of slides and a letter and all this stuff. Man, I was tired. And I set it out. And he went to France and he showed it to the curator. And the curator said she liked my work. So they invited me to be part of the show. It's all because I decided to talk to Paco at the Borders Books. So if you ever run into somebody, an old, an old friend, and you're kind of nervous if you should talk to him or not, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, I made this piece as a, as a piece to take over there. And it was very large. It's about as big as it sits right here. I mean, it's made out of fiberboard. All of these pieces are made out of medium density fiberboard and cut with a router. And the middle part was made out of styrofoam. So I was still trying to balance this kind of ancient, Antiquate, antiquated sort of form in relationship to some more contemporary grates. What I like about this one is because when you look at it, the way the light shines through, it makes all these shadows along the wall. And as you move across it, the shadows kind of move. And it creates like a moray pattern, sort of like looking at a vinyl record from the side. You know what I mean? So that piece came out pretty good. And I was so honored to be part of that exhibition over there. Then, in 2000 or 1999, I got an opportunity to move, and it was a really good opportunity of teaching, full-time teaching job here at Illinois Central College. So we moved to Peoria in 99 from Taos. Now that's a big adjustment. I mean, you go from the Taos Valley to the, to the Illinois Valley. Um, so it took some getting used to. And then also, I was trying to respond to more urban sort of feeling because I mean, it's pretty urban around in here. So I made this painting, it's a smaller one, that combines multiple views of what? It's like a by prospect, you know? Somebody, I showed this to somebody and they said, hey, I know exactly where that is. It's right on the intersection over there by where that Walgreens is, up on Prospect Avenue, right? Where the old uh, Cohen's furniture used to be. The railroad tracks go right through it. I said, that's exactly right. But they recognized it from the painting. Just look on the sidewalk. So I thought, okay. Now I'm trying to figure out, because I got an opportunity to do a show um, at the Contemporary Art Center, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't think I can show grates at the Contemporary Art Center because the walls are yelled in there. The walls are all bright red and they're red and they're just so powerful, I don't think my work's gonna show up on there. So I don't know what to do. And then I have to credit Anita because then I have to credit her so much because she has been uh, my teacher, my greatest teacher over all of this time in helping me figure out things. You, you heard her talk about formal aspects and color theory and relationships of form, value, color, direction, mark, all that. She influences me and helps me with all the issues that I have. So she says, why don't you start making molds? And so why don't you make molds of what? Why don't you make molds of the things that interest you off the ground? Kind of like you were doing the sewer breaks, but you make molds. Now that's not the first time somebody has suggested that I make molds before. And I said, what do, you what do you mean? So there were these water meters that were behind her house, and she goes, come on, I'll show you. So we go out back, on a Sunday afternoon, and we make, we make a little plaster batch, and she, she shows me how to prepare the site, and we made a little plaster mold of the water meter behind our house, you know? And it kind of crumbled. Well, it didn't really work. It, the slip was a little bit too soft, but it was the very first one. So we got in a little art argument there over the, over the <laughs> you know, water meter. But it was only because the plaster was just a little too thin. We had to get that mix right. So it was very intriguing for me. I thought, okay. Maybe I can work with this. And I was an artist, I'm like, no, every idea has to be mine, right? It all is me. But the truth is, is that we feed off of each other and we feed off of culture and every single stimulus that we have. So for me to deny that possibility would be to just sort of like set something, it's up to me to make something out of it. 
but it's up to me also to hear what other people have to say, to put into it. So I tried it, and I started making more molds, and this thing took off on me suddenly. So I had a show in 2001, and it was based off of mold making and casting. So I'm gonna really quickly, here's just a little rundown. Mold making, molding is the process of manufacturing and shaping by shaping liquid or pliable raw material around or over an object using a rigid frame called a mold, forming a reverse impression of the object. So you have the object, and then you have the mold of the object. Same here. Uh, I'll get this a little more in the round with a little mold. Then casting is a different part of this process. So casting is a manufacturing process by which liquid materials, the liquid material is usually poured into a mold which contains a hollow cavity of the desired shape and then allowed to solidify. The solidified part or casting is ejected or broken out of the mold to complete the process, taking the shape of the original object from which the mold is made. So for me, it was easy because I was making these flat molds off of the ground. You can come in single part and you can lift them straight off unless there are some undercuts which you can take care of with clay. So here's the types of molds you can use. You know, I mean, you can have a, let's see, a pair of pointer. Yeah. Just, I've already talked about a plaster mold. These are types of plastic and urethane or rubber molds. You can make a ceramic mold, which I learned about later on. And then there's a one-piece mold, which is the what I use, and the two-piece molds. These are your materials that you can cast out of. Metal is typically used as a high level of casting. That's not what I do. You know, so that would be something like bronze, like Preston Jackson. Plastic resin is another very popular material that people use, and they also make it look and appear like metal by painting it. Concrete is highly, cast, uh, is highly popular in casting nowadays because of how contemporary it looks. And then also plaster clay, and what I have found to use is paper pulp. That's worked really well for me because of how lightweight it is and how fragile I think it is as well. Okay, so some basic materials you need. You need some compounds to make the mold. You need some sealant to seal off the ground. And then you need some paste wax and oil to get it slick so that the mold will release. They're called release agents to allow you to pick the mold up off the ground. Then this is like a newer material, it's called polyvinyl acetate, and I use it because it's actually an inner compound that's, that's made with completely all organic materials, and it kind of turns into a plastic film, and it's super thin, and you can get wonderful detailed results out of using that, and also when it biodegrades, it doesn't harm the environment, supposedly, is what they told me. Anyway, the last is silicone spray, which uses a safe gap to just kind of spray off and keep things from sticking other stuff to use in the process. So let's go. Um, when I started doing this in 2000, I began, like the first one was just down right here. It was just right behind the museum. It's all been torn up now. But I think it's perfect because there was this old, I think it was a 19th century grave that was on the ground. And my friend Jamie Moore, he's the one that showed me a lot of these artifacts. He was a teacher over at the ICC Academy. And he turned out, lo and behold, this guy, he likes sewer covers and manhole covers and grapes, and he loves everything that I love. So he goes, well, let me take you around town, and I'm going to show you where I go. I said, okay. He goes, well, when do you want to go? So I said, I don't know. It's a Friday afternoon. He says, well, how about now? And I said, well, okay. So here we go. We go around town, and he showed me all these sites around south side, downtown, and I started making molds out. So this is Jimmy's picture of that. First one I made, I think. The piece that came off of it looks like this. So that's a cast piece that's made, and this one is in, in particular is made out of paper. It's really thin. And then I'm able to paint it with acrylic paint and stuff like that and replicate the finish of the, of the landscape. Some really interesting things happen because, one, I'm trying to like recreate the landscape, and at the same time, I'm out there making a mold all day, which means that you, a lot of people come by. I mean, the things that happen in the process are so much a part of the result of it. That it's so much fun being involved in the landscape to make these pieces. So I'll roll, roll through a couple of them. Jimmy took me around down by Apple and Adams is where this was done. It's down further on the warehouse district. And there were these old metal doors sitting on the ground. I said, oh man, I've got to make a bowl. Now this is probably one I've practiced a few times before I, did, before I attempted this. And I also had an assistant help me. 
Um, so these photos are by my neighbor, Scott Cavanaugh. I want to give him credit because he came down and was interested enough to take pictures of what we were doing. And then he gave them to me. So that's why I have these. Thank you, Scott. All right, so basically what I'm working with here is the urethane mold, and I've already prepped the site, and the doors are what you see underneath here. And um, this is just putting rubber, a layer of liquid rubber over the surface using a spatula. This piece is pretty big. It's about, I don't know, six feet tall, four or five feet wide. So it took a lot of product to make the mold. Then there's Luke. My, my, uh, he was a student of mine at the time. If I get students that wanted to help me out, hand 10 bucks an hour and come on and help. If you haven't met Luke, he's an artist. He lives down in uh, Pekin. And he does a lot of mural work nowadays. So Luke's helping me prepare this, this mold. And we're using the rubber. This is a rubber urethane mold that we're doing. Putting some of the final coats on, the joints especially, where the door comes together. The hinges were really thick. It took a lot. It was so hot that day. Oh, it was burning up. And then the last thing we did was we had a, a frame around here. I had to pour a plaster or a sheet over this over the surface of it to make a rigid back so that it'll swim them. That flexible mold sits on that rigid back and will make a good proper form. There's my board over on the side and I'm ready to take the mold off. So here we go. We start with the wedges on the bottom of it, start to peel up the plaster off of the rubber. And you can see just a little close up process. There we are trying to get that corner. And the whole trick is to get the whole thing off without breaking the plaster. And most of the time, we're successful, but sometimes it'll crack and break, and that's too bad. Okay, so there you've got this whole sheet. You can see it's probably pretty heavy. And we're flipping it up and over on its back to set on that board. So the board's really important to have there in the first place. Then comes the rubber mold, taking it up off the ground. So we start peeling the whole thing like one big blanket. And this worked out perfectly. The mix came out. There was nothing wrong with any of it. It, was, it set so well. I had to let it set up overnight. We got home, leave it, and come back the next day to take it off. And then you can see, like, getting a close-up of the ring of the, that's the door handle. And folding it and rolling it back. That's what it looks like once we get it off. So that's my whole piece. And then we lay it down onto that plaster back. And that's what I ended up with. So mold original. Okay. And that's what the door kind of looked like after we were finished. I mean, it was better than that when we came up. If you hose it off, it's be back to the rusty old self that it was. And that's the painting that I made out of it. It was one that I hung up over here at the Contemporary Art Center for a show that I had in 2006. So I got to have two shows in that space over there. I feel so fortunate. And the first show was all about manual covers. But this one, I started to branch out and like cast other things, like these glass squares and weird stuff that's on the ground, you know, that I found. So one of the later ones I did was I went back and visited my mom in Kansas City. That's where I grew up. And this is a, a view of the downtown Kansas City from, I can't remember the name of the park. It's on Southwest Boulevard. But they had this huge concrete piece up there. And I thought, oh, man. I've got to do this. <laughs> so it's beautiful. Penn Valley Park is where it is, up on the high rise. I mean, it's just gorgeous up there. It's a real nice area. But there's a lot of gangsters and stuff that hang out there at night, you know, so it's not a very nice neighborhood. So when I first came on it, this sewer cover was sitting on the top and it had all of these tags and stuff. And the guy's name was, you look at some motor, you know, but with the T is like a little person and it's sad because they're crying. The little faces are have sad faces and they're also crying. Then I started to figure out what it was and what it meant. And I'm pretty sure this is another person, Karen Zink or something like that. And this guy motors are Webb? I don't know. Anyway, I had to take it all off because when you when you um prepare this site, you have to put some paste wax on it. Paste wax took all of their graffiti off. So it, I mean, it was really worried. It was a long day of me fretting whether the, these guys and these taggers were going to come find me messing up their work, <laughs> which I did. Anyway, so that's what it looks like, the whole artifact. I imagine it's probably about eight, the whole slab is probably eight feet long by five or six feet wide. And I only took a section of it, a big section of it that was located in the center of it. 
And the center of that was the manhole cover. That was what I really wanted. So that's my setup. And I just drove over there, took all this stuff, grabbed, grabbed, grabbed my dolly, hauled it all, all up the hill, because you couldn't park up there, and then started getting to work. This is that the way the piece looked with the climbing vinyl acetate over the surface of it and the frame right before I pour the right before I start laying the rubber down. Okay, and this was the final piece. I thought that came out pretty good. Now the first version of this didn't look like this, but I spent probably six more months working on all the details of the rock and trying to get a real faithful image. I didn't put the graffiti on except on this one part right here, I left the, the motor on there, M-O-T-E-R, which was his tag and it was actually on the original like that too. So I thought that piece came out pretty good. On the residency in Taos, I got to go to, in, up into Utah, um, and I've always wanted to go to this particular place, which is Muley Point. It sits on the top of the San Juan River, and way in the background, all of that up there is Monument Valley. You know, it's in Arizona. So you look a real far distance up there, and all the rock is slick rock. It's just this gorgeous slick rock. Beautiful patterns. So I decided to take a mold up there. I got this friend of mine um, from Santa Fe, the old friend of mine that I knew, and he wanted to go camping with me, so he came with me, and I made a mold out in this wilderness area, ordered some material, and, and took it with me and decided to take a mold of the slick rock in this public use area. So there it's me making a mold right before it starts getting dark. I think it's kind of funny. Like way out in the middle of nowhere. And it's surreal because it, as the night starts to fall, just this yellow blanket sitting there on the rock. I took a couple of shots of it like that. I don't have a, an image of the piece of this one, but I thought that the location was enough right there for me to show you. So when we went in 2010, we got lucky. I, I, um, I got to go as a visiting art, visit, not a visiting artist, but as a visiting faculty member over to Canterbury in England for a whole semester and lead a group of uh, students from Illinois community colleges over there. So I took a group of students in Anita, and we, we brought our kids with us, and we spent three months over in Canterbury, England. So I got a chance to talk and lecture with the, uh, the students down there at a couple of different places, campuses they had. And as I was at this one place, one town, it was called Folkestone, which was over by the sea. It's in southeastern England. I saw this is great. And this is, this is the way they do it over there. There's a lot of them like this. There are these pieces of glass that are embedded into a metal frame, and some of them are broken and spalled. It reminds me of one I took in Peoria a long time ago. So I thought that I would make a mold of it, and I teach the students how to do it at Folkestone. So we got some material, and we put together to make a plaster mold as a group. The students helped me. So first you get the bucket, you whip up your plaster like that. You got a little tool in there, it helps out a lot. Then the, the piece has already been framed, you can see, and greased down so that the plaster will release, hopefully, pretty well. Pour the plaster in. Put a piece of chicken wire in there to hold the whole thing together, you know, and set it down in while the plaster is still setting up. And then you just wait for a while. So that's us waiting. And this is the whole group, you know, um, the teacher. This is Oh yeah. There's the teacher, Katrina, and she also happened to own the pub, which was right across the street from where I lived. <laughs> so that was interesting. And then all of her students, all these people came from different places like Bulgaria, this girl was from South America, this guy was from England, some of them were English, but they were from all over the world. And so I got a chance to work with these people, with these kids, and help them show them how to make this process, which they may never use. Anyway, that was fun, it was a good opportunity. Then, before I left, you know, up in Folkestone, I was walking around one day, and I saw this place right here. But that is super cool, because look at this sewer grate that's on there. I mean, look at all the color and how rich it is with texture. You can see it's wet. So I thought, I'm going to make this. I'm going to make a mold of this. And they showed me some things in England about how to make a, a clay mold and fire it. So I made some pieces like that. And they also showed me a type of a rubber that you can melt down in a big, huge crock pot and just pour over the surface and let it harden and peel it back up. And you can use it and then reuse it and melt it down for another mold. So I bought some and I rented a car because I didn't have a car. And I got everything ready. 
and I got the keys to the lab in Folkestone when I had to drive down there on a, one morning, the one of my last days there, and it was pouring rain of all the days. Fortunately, this rubber you could use in the rain, it wouldn't make a difference. So I went on down, and I was supposed to get this guy to help me, but he backed out, I'm by myself. And when I got there, this is the same sign. Like, here's the, the little place I wanna make my mold off of. And right next to it is the whole city. Like the city's got there, the water department's there, and they're jackhammering this whole area up right where I wanna work, these guys. And they were already there, they are already set. So this is my little bit right here. And I went up to the guy and I said, hey, um, who's the foreman here? And this guy's, I am him. I said, well, uh, I, I really wanna, their pylon was sitting over here. And I said, I really gotta work right here. I just, I wanna work right here. That's the only one of those that there was that was perfect like that. I just wanna make a mold. What are you doing? What, what, what? Well, I wanna make a mold of this little grate right here. No, 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 can't do it, can't have it. We're busy, we're not going You know, I said, well, is this, what are you doing now? What, what? Well, I'm trying to, but I'm really, I'm artist, I'm trying to make a mold. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, and all I need you to do is move this pylon over a little bit if you're not working over here. Oh, okay, I'll move the pylon. So he moves the pylon, and then they said, okay, the next thing you know, they give me headphones for because they're jackhammer. They're going, hey, do you need some water? You know, it's like, they're helping me out. These people, they're so nice at first they say no. So I'm able to take a mold off of this impression on the street. It was fun. Oops, did it again. So then there's that site again, storefront, their stuff. And by the end of it, they, were, <laughs> they let me take their picture. So these are the two gentlemen from Canterbury or from Folkestone that let me, that while they were jackhammering, let me make a mold. It's kind of fun. I still haven't done anything with that except for make some paper parts off of it, like a lot of paper parts. Then as I was going down through there, there was all these uh, flint rock walls. Actually, they're flint stone, not rock, because it was rock is American term. I don't know if you knew that or not, but they're stones. They're not rocks. So they're flint stones. And these walls are amazing. Like, this is like a 700-year-old wall here. So the, the people in the ceramic slab showed me how to make a clay mold, which is basically, they extruded a big slab of clay. I went up and I greased up the wall. I stuck it on there, formed it, and pulled it back off, and they fired them for me. So I brought back some molds of these. They're small. They're like this big. This piece is like 18 by 24. And that's what I have to work with from here out. <laughs> so that's about where I'm at with my work right now. These last two pieces, last few pieces are what are going to work, feed me for the next, I don't know, the rest of my life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it. What about, do we have any questions or anything? Sorry, guys, I took too long. You didn't talk about how you paint them. Oh, well, that's a different process. You know, they come so back up real quick, but to paint them is like the first thing that I try to do. <coughs> is a series of washes, you know, and it's really, really thin wash, so you can sort of see some of the orange through here, and some of the gray that kind of comes and goes. The whole thing, sometimes I'll put neon colors on the bottom of it, just to see if I can get them to peek through a little bit later, that influence. So one wash of a vibrant red, and then another wash of a green, sort of like mutes it out a little bit, and you save and pick places, and then I come back with more opaque paints, and begin to paint some of the rust colors. But what works really for me is that some of these colors that are in here are still some of the early colors, the first ones that you put down, because they're the most vibrant, because they take on the white of the paper. And after that, they become opaque, and they're, they're those dirty colors. That's what one of my students calls them. I don't like those dirty colors. But they, you have to have the dirty colors for the, for the really brilliant ones to kind of seem through. Then after that, I just look for raised edges and stuff, and I try to pick it apart and use more opaque paints and develop it. A lot of wiping goes into it. You know, like, I lay down some paint and then wipe it back off. In fact, in my opinion, half of painting is white. <laughs> it really is, because with the residue of what you get, that after effect, especially for this work, it really helps. Um, so then there's also the hills and valleys approach. Like, if you imagine this is a landscape, the hills are the raised areas, and then the valleys are the low areas. So when you flood with a wash, it hits the valleys. So a lot of dark can go in there. You can also flood with a light wash. And then when you scumble or glaze, or, you, or glaze or scumble especially, scumbling is a dry brush technique. Just I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but what you do is you take a big brush and you load it up with a bunch of pigment and no water, okay? It was just paint, so that it's really, really dry. And then it's got, it helps if it's a soft brush. 
and you pass it over the surface of the piece, and it catches the hills. So you flood the valleys, and you stumble the peaks, the hills. And that's a technique that sort of can help separate the top layer from the bottom layer. Does that help? Give me an idea? OK. John, mm -hmm. how do you support the paper so that it doesn't break? Or It must be pretty fragile. Well, like on the back of this one, there's a, a, a one by three frame. But I make it so that the three goes in and the one is just the thick. I want it to be so it's about an inch and a quarter thick. So there's a frame that goes around the whole thing, probably with some crossbars. And on the back of the paper, I back it with canvas and some sizing to kind of keep it. And then I put some gesso and some other sizing on the front of it. And I can use an epoxy resin over the edges on the outside to kind of keep them from getting dinged up too much. Still, they're pretty fragile. But any painting, really, when you think about it, it's fragile. If you go by a, a, a canvas painting and hit it, you're going to put a score in it. Same thing with this. So that's kind of how I do it. I'll back it. Other times I'll use like resin, an epoxy resin. Was one of this guy that I met. I mean, I learned these things from meeting people in the industry. They tell me stuff, you know. <laughs> this guy that gave me a showdown in St. Louis told me all about this West Systems epoxy, which is low VOC, and you can use it indoors. It's the safest product that's on the market. I had no idea it existed. So you back these. You can back some of these with that epoxy resin. Also, people use it for their boats and stuff. 